26th school committee meeting to order tonight. Uh, we have a quorum of four. You can slide down. <laughs> uh, Mr. Caruso had a something he had to do, and I guess Elaine, well, she show she was at our casa and went home sick. So she's uh, uh, so tonight we'll uh, start with our. Uh, Birch Meadow presentation. Actually, first, if there's any public input, uh, seeing none, uh, we'll s start with our Birch Meadow presentation. Thank Welcome. you very much. Um, so I appreciate this opportunity uh, for Birch Meadow to be here this evening. I have uh, two teachers that are here to present to you uh, some information about how teachers are leaders in our schools and you'll get a sense of what that looks like as they go through their presentation but we've had an opportunity over the last several weeks to learn um, from educational leaders about our massachusetts tiered our multi-tiered systems of support and when you talk to leaders in this field they talk about the importance of leadership not just coming from the principal level but really building it up from the ground level with teachers and you'll see as we go through the presentation tonight what that looks like at birch meadow uh, and how we foster that and i'm very happy to have Danielle and Patty here, both of them are going through an education program to be um, leaders as well. So they're getting their principal licensure over the next uh, year. So it's exciting to have them go through that process uh, and watch them learn and grow. And uh, you'll see that they're excellent leaders in their own right. Uh, and I'm sure someday will be principals very soon. So I'll turn it over to them. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm a kindergarten teacher at Birch Meadow, and um, we just wanted to start by saying that we're so fortunate in Reading to have such great leaders both district-wide and at the school level. Um, we have great leaders as superintendent, assistant superintendent, principals, and many others. Yes, and as a matter of fact, we also have such dedicated professional teachers as well that um, share their expertise and their knowledge and their talents with us and are given the opportunity to do that in leadership roles. And so tonight, that's what we want to talk to you about, is how teacher leaders impact our school culture and our student achievement. So Patty and I did some research on um, teacher leadership and really what is teacher leadership. And we found some quotes that really stood out to us, so please read at your pleasure as I speak. I'm not going to read directly from the quotes, but I am highlighting what's said in, in, throughout them. So teacher leadership is having a voice in policies and decisions that affect our profession, our daily work, and shape our professional learning communities. Teacher leadership is sharing in decisions that typically are made by administrators. Teacher leadership is a process by which teachers influence their colleagues and principals and others to improve teaching and learning practices and increase student achievement. Teacher leadership is facilitating within a school. So we are really, again, we're very fortunate. We have a very strong leadership team at Birch Meadow. It's made up of um, teachers from every grade level, from kindergarten through fifth grade, as well as our school psychologist and our principal. And our purpose is to make some important decisions and collaborate on those decisions, and also to look at student achievement and the um, school culture. So as Eric noted, much of our work as a leadership team um, at Birch Meadow has been focused upon developing our multi-tiered system of support. Um, and we have worked hard as a team and really had great input throughout this process, which has been really helpful and beneficial to us as a whole school community. And MTSS, as you all know, is a framework for school improvement to meet the academic and behavioral needs of children in, within a safe environment and our schools, our district, and our state support this initiative. There we go. So back when we first started with MTSS, it was almost two years ago now. And one of the things that we needed to do as a leadership team was to come up with core values. Um, these are character traits that we felt were the most important behaviors that we wanted to see um, exhibited in our school and in our students. 
And so we came up with what we thought were the, the most important, which is being present, safe, kind, responsible, and respectful. And these kind of are, an umbre are umbrella ideas, too. They, there's so much more. Any, basically, any of the good behaviors that you see can fit into one of those categories. So these are our core values, and they're constantly being taught and promoted and reinforced throughout the school day and throughout the classrooms and the school. One of the ways that we promote them is with give me five. And I know this is kind of a traditional thing for you to call attention to someone or ask for someone's attention, give me five. And that is that is one of the purposes behind give me five in our school. But when you ask for give me five to our students, um, they know that they need to pay attention, but they also are recalling these core values, being present, safe, kind, responsible, and respectful. And I've been testing my students this week. And I said, give me five, and they get very quiet. And then I say, do you know what that means? Every time, they tell me the five core values. So it's working. Part of our work as a leadership team has been to develop school-wide consistency in many ways. As Patty mentioned, the Give Me Five is a huge piece to school-wide consistency. It shows students that the values are not just present in their classroom, but they are school-wide expectations. And you'll see things throughout the school, so that Give Me Five image is throughout our building. Um, it's in our hallways, it's in every classroom, it's in our gymnasium, it's in our cafeteria, everywhere, as well as um, you'll see these throughout the hallway. So this is our Birch Meadow Way plaque. So it's constantly a visual reminder to the students and actions such as give me five develop that consistency where if you walk into one classroom you'll see the same thing that you see when you walk into another classroom and these strategies and um, the core values being seen throughout okay another piece to the school-wide consistency go ahead patty is um, our development of our behavior expectation matrix and our behavior expectation matrix really um, takes the areas throughout the school and then it separates them into the values and it shows exactly what expected behavior is in each of the areas. But not only does it show what expected behavior is, but it aligns them to the values that we're teaching these children and really um, they're internalizing. So it's great. Um, we developed this as a leadership team and we spent so much time on it. Really those valuable conversations that took place throughout this process were so beneficial to us as a team um, and to our school as a whole. So back again with our MTSS and um, <clears throat> our core values, we wanted to find a way to recognize those students that were exhibiting these core values every day. And so as a leadership team, we came up with the Positive Character Awards. It's Paul because we're the Virtue Bears. So at the beginning of the school year, teachers are given enough cards for each of the students in their classroom. They're encouraged to fill out these cards when they see a child exhibiting one of the core values. So they fill out the name and the reason um, they're being responsible because they remember their homework constantly. And then these cards are brought into the office and the child's name is announced over the loudspeaker by Eric um, during morning announcements. And the cards are also displayed in the hallways. But um, Teachers aren't the only ones that are encouraged to do this. Any, anyone in the school, any staff member, is encouraged to recognize the student and to celebrate that they're following our core values. Additionally, we send them home to parents. So families are in the loop too. And they are encouraged to fill these out when they see their children at home displaying the Birch Metal core values. And again, they send them in. Their names are, the child's name is read over the loudspeaker. The, car, the core value card is up on the, in the hallway, and as we go to lunch every day, they get to see and that behavior is reinforced and they're constantly recognized that they're exhibiting these core values. Another piece of our leadership team's work has been to develop um, some school-wide assembly formats. So what we do for our school-wide assemblies is we break them up half the year. So half of the year we spend with grade level teams presenting at school meetings and they're really focusing on a value, one value at each assembly. One value, teaching the matrix ex explicitly so that us as teachers and the teachers throughout the school can go back to their classrooms and really model that with their students. 
The second half of the year, what we do for our assemblies is teacher leaders um, run the assemblies and they focus more so on one area of the school. So we're looking at the top part of our matrix and we're really looking at what each of those values looks like in one area. So we'll break it down and we'll say, okay, this assembly is on classroom behavior or expected behavior. And we really focus on what present looks like in the classroom. If you're present in the classroom, this is what you look like. If you're safe in the classroom, this is what you look like. And it's really explicitly teaching that, modeling it for the students up front, and really um, conveying that ownership to the teachers to go back to their classrooms and really um, teach it and teach it directly to them within the classroom. So another thing that our leadership team has worked on is our develop, uh, Birch Meadow Cares program. And our Birch Meadow Cares is um, a community service partnership that we are working on as a school. So we, what we do is we, each grade level representative from the leadership team connects with an outside or organization. And we have conversations about how we can best support that organization. And we've done programs such as the Food Pantry in Reading. We've done the Senior Center in Reading. We've done birth, um, Birthday Wishes, which is, I believe it's in Reading still. Um, we've done the real program, which is in Lynn, and our fifth graders this year have decided to do some in-house community service. So they are actually coming down to the other grade levels and really providing support within the classrooms, which is a really nice touch. Our um, teacher leaders are a really important part of our school council. Um, the school council is made up of the teacher leaders and parents and our principal and we meet each month. The purpose of it is to look at school improvement. So at the beginning of the school year, the school council looks at these, the school improvement plan, and each year we pick a particular area that we want to focus on and target and work on all year to benefit the school. So in the past, we've done things like, we looked at um, water conservation and recycling and reusing um, and promoting that. We've also, last year we updated our headline page. We looked at it, we thought it needed a little bit of a facelift. And we wanted to make it more user friendly, so we worked on that. Um, and this year we're working on school safety. And again, it connects a lot with our MTSS program. We've enlisted the support of our fourth and fifth grade students. They've applied to be um, student safety monitors. We actually had a meeting today. And they're very excited about it. But they will be, um, helping to keep our school a little bit safer. They'll be monitoring student drop-off in the morning and monitoring our hallways and our playground areas. So we're not only providing a little bit of extra safety for our school, which is already safe, but a little bit more, um, but we're also allowing these students to get some skills in leadership and responsibility. So teachers, te teaching teachers is something that happens regularly at Birch Meadow. Um, as a result of our telemath survey that we took last spring, um, it, the, the results of the telemath survey showed a need for differentiated professional development. Um, and the teachers rated the, you know, rated the survey and the results showed that Birch Meadow teachers want professional development to be more differentiated. So what Eric did was he looked at our leaders throughout our school and really um, we worked to align them. and. We looked at the needs of teachers and we looked at the strengths of teachers and we looked to see what teachers could really teach their colleagues and what, how did it match up to what they wanted to learn. And um, we also looked at what teachers could model for their colleagues. Coming into the classroom, model if you feel really strong in writer's workshop, you could come, have someone come on in, there showed a need for writer's workshop, those two teachers would connect and there'd be a set of observations. So it's really been something that's been very exciting yeah. at our school. Um, another piece to um, our to teachers, teacher, and teachers is we often have teachers facilitating at staff meetings, whether it's small conversations, um, or part of the leadership team's work is to convey all that we do within our leadership team to the rest of the school staff. So that's something that also takes place during our staff meeting times, and really we're teaching them all about this MTSS and really giving them um, all that we've created so that they can make it, bring it back to their classrooms and really um, bring it to effect. Um, another thing that we do is we have some, P we have PLC facilitators within our, within our building and who are trained in SRI, so they're doing that as well. Um, we have um, Sarah Hansen, teacher leaders that 
facilitate our student council. Our student council is made up of fourth and fifth grade students who are elected by their peers because they want to promote our school culture and our school spirit. It's a very enthusiastic group of students. And um, some of the things they do, they really are, are community service oriented and school service oriented. So some of the things that we work on together are um, the Festival of the Trees. Each year they come up with a theme, they make the ornaments, they decorate the tree, and they, they help with that. Um, we run the Codes for Kids drive together. We've raised money through Pennies for Patients, which benefits the Leukemia and Lymphoma Foundation. Internally, we work on the school store and we host movie nights. And then when, um, when Birch Meadow is a host um, elementary school for Blue Ribbon, our student council acts as ambassadors and they escort our guests around the school. And, um, so, so again, it teaches them leadership and gives them additional responsibilities. <coughs> So um, one of the most looked for events or sought after events at Birch Meadow is our Read Across America program that we have each year. And it's a month long celebration and our teacher leader librarian um, really gets this celebration underway and really connects with family members and um, community members and students and teachers in this process. So it applies to all of the grades and our school librarian really works hard to make sure that everyone is involved. And it really does instill a love of learning and reading throughout our community. So we have a student support team. We call it affectionately the SST. And um, this is made up of teacher leaders as well. The teacher leaders are teachers, our school specialists, and our school psychologists. And they meet weekly to help other teachers, assist other teachers that come to them with challenges that they may be facing with a student, whether it's behaviorally, academically, or <coughs> emotionally. And this again is where our teacher leaders are helping by giving their expertise and their experience, and they can strategize and come up with different interventions and different strategies and new ideas maybe for, um, to, to help teachers and to assist in these student challenges. So the, this support group, this, these teacher leaders are really assisting other teachers in um, helping students and helping teachers as well. So another piece where um, teachers can really be leaders in, within Birch Meadow is to assist in grant writing. So we've done many grants over the past few years. One grant that we've, um, that teacher leaders have assisted with uh, um, it was a social emotional grant and that was received through the Regent Reading Education Foundation and it, it um, developed classroom libraries to connect our classroom, classroom libraries to our core values. So we um, wrote the grant to collect one book or more for each value for each classroom at each grade level to have. So it's really, it's great to really use as a teaching tool um, and another, our music teacher has written two grants. She did one for baritone ukuleles and she has a classroom set of them. And she also did one for hand chimes. And we are in the process of, um, well, we're always looking for other opportunities for grant writing. We're really fortunate, as I mentioned before, that so many of our teacher leaders share their expertise and talents. And we're really fortunate that our fine arts teachers are willing to share their talents because they're amazing. So these teacher leaders are very important to Birch Meadow. Our music teacher, in addition to instilling the love of music in our students, she comes back in the evenings and she works with our third, fourth, and fifth graders to develop our school chorus. And she prepares them for performances on the school, at the school and district level. Um, and here they're, they're working with hand chimes. Um, also our art teacher, again, a very dedicated and talented person who works with students all day long and then supports Birch Meadow in a variety of ways. One most recently is she developed a drawing contest for students to support the Read Across America program. So that was, and that was really successful. And also she um, coordinates and displays all of the student artwork for presentation at the Arts Fest in April. So, and I know that's a, a huge undertaking. So, 
A huge part of Birch Meadow is our school culture. We have a very positive school culture and it doesn't happen that way just um, because of nothing. So we have this great group of teachers that um, leads and coordinates our social events and that m might be just a monthly breakfast to really kind of you know, set everyone's day off on the right path or it might be some outside activities that we do um, as a staff. We might have um, many different things um, throughout the school year. So this really enhances our positive, already positive school culture and it really um, supports our school. So. Yeah. And you can see that when you come, come visit us. Mm -hmm. You'll see it. It's very apparent. Mm -hmm. Our um, reading teacher is a, a great teacher leader. She, um, she meets with uh, grade level teams each week to look at curriculum and instruction. So over the course of six weeks, she's met with every single grade level. Um, what their purpose is is to look at specific student uh, um, academic data and to see how they're pro progressing and to see if there's any interventions that need to take place to strategize and to look at student growth. So we look at the most up-to-date current da data assessment and identify some needs. And again, that collaboration and that sharing of best practices and <coughs> expertise is so important. And so she leads these teachers along that path and helps to support the teachers and to impact student achievement. So we wanted to leave you with this quote. and. The quote is, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And we believe truly that this can not only apply to students, but can apply to teachers as well. So thank you for having us here. Do you have questions? Thank you so much. Great job. Thanks, Good job. Good job. I, I had a and question. If there's anything that we can you know, address for you, or clarify for you, or expand on, we're happy to do that. I had a question on the uh, slide with, the, I guess, the high five. Mm -hmm. what, yeah. <laughs> what happens if, if you uh, recognize a student that's doing something that isn't on that high five? How do you handle that? We actually have a strategy for it. That we have um, a procedure. So the first thing in a classroom, say this is the classroom and, and Chuck's not really behaving. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, give me five. And, everybody else around you is probably going to give me five mm. and be quiet. And the next step might be, I'll say, Craig, I really, really like the way you gave me five and you're sitting so quietly. You know, and, and so it's, it's more like a, a peer pressure at that point. Sure. You know, the kids start looking and Chuck's the one that's not giving five. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, we go through steps like that. There's actually, it's outlined in our MTSS program specifically what we should be doing and uh, it works it's been great and the philosophy behind the whole MTSS um, framework is to for it to all be positive behavior um, right. intervention so as we grow as a school and we're getting better at really focusing on I love the way you're sitting so nicely you're being so present I love the way you're being present really using that language and um, pointing out the behaviors that we see that are that are positive I think that those behaviors are going to lessen and um, as Patty said there are defined um, steps towards you know addressing needs of children that um, may not be positive um, but I think the overall picture as a school moving in that direction and a district moving in that direction is um, the, the right way for us so right. thank you Jean thank you for the presentation that was Awesome. Um, I have a question about implementation from K through five. So you've got little five-year-olds and you're doing sort of very similar strategy right up through 11-year-olds. Can you talk a little bit about how you differentiate the, the general themes for such a, a developmentally big group? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we actually, in, in some of our um, assemblies, that's actually been a little bit of a challenge because if we're addressing the students and <clears throat> Um, modeling behaviors for students in kindergarten, you know, it might not be the thing that the fifth grader wants to look at or wants to hear, and vice versa. So, you know, it is kind of an area that we have to really concentrate on and so and, and work on. So we, we differentiate a lot in that respect in our assemblies. 
Um, we've done music, we've done videos, um, books, PowerPoints, um, role modeling, you know, and, and skits and things like that. And we also um, often have students involved in them. And so that brings um, that connection as well. And so the students are more engaged at that point, yeah, changing it up. But I think the basic ideas of those core values are understood by everyone. And certainly it's, it's up to the teacher to express what's a present. The first assembly was a present. We're not talking about something that you're going to open up. It's not a box with a big bow on it. Um, it means, and we have specific things, it means you're sitting, your hands are quiet, your, you know, your body is quiet, you're listening, um, you're showing me the listening look. Um, certainly those things are, you know, in the primary grades, in the upper grades, they do have that understanding, but it, it's a little more um, mature. Uh, but they, these, these core values really apply to all of them and they're understood by all the, by everyone, and probably at different levels. I'll just add to that a little bit too as well. Um, so I think too, the whole school um, lesson for the, the assembly is, just really just a basic for kids to get and then when we go back into our classrooms that is when we really bring it down to our kindergarten level or they bring it to their fifth grade level also um, the the reading education foundation grant that we received the books at each level that are used to teach the values are not the same at kindergarten as they are in fifth grade so they're differentiated in that way so fifth grade has a different set of books than kindergarten has so there's lots of ways that we do that, um, but it depends on the grade level and um, ex for exactly what it looks like. But there are definitely some things built in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so very good, very good, very nice job. I appreciate you. your time. Um, and um, I, I really value shared leadership. I think it's really an important piece of education that um, hasn't always been as prevalent as it now in this day and age. But speaking to that, um, how is the leadership team um, selected? Is it based on seniority or um, interest or peers uh, selecting from their grade? Is it selected grade level? I got, Ideally, it? we'd like one from each grade level. I think mm -hmm. way back when it wasn't it wasn't as structured as it is now. Um, it was, you know, if you want to be on it, sign up. And, and I, I believe it's it was more of I'd like one from each grade level. Um, we've been together for a few years, a couple of years anyway, two or three years now, mm -hmm. the same team. Um, but certainly that doesn't mean that new people can, can't come in and, and mix it up a little and get, bring new ideas in. But I believe it was They're more, it was, it was voluntary, yeah, it was more like, this is what I'd like to see, mm -hmm. I'd like to see a representative from each grade level just so that we have that, um, you know, the communication and, <coughs> and input from every area. Again, working at, you know, that differentiation and looking at kindergarten through fifth grade, it's a big spectrum, so. Um, but it is voluntary, so, you know, if you wanna, if you wanna be involved, and it's, it's been really beneficial and, and just, you know, just very eye-opening, and, and it's great to be on that leadership team. And the other question I had uh, pertains to the data um, that the reading teacher is responsible yes. to um, over, oversee or, or look at. Is that specific to reading or ELA or is it also math? It just I was just curious. We are incorporating both into our data team meetings. So we're looking at um, mostly ELA, but we do have discussions about the math curriculum that's occurring and what, what we, where we are as a grade level and what, what we're having some difficulty with or what we find um, our students are really strong at. So we'll have those con kinds of conversations, but I think overall we're moving towards, we're looking, we're looking at a data team structure um, as a result of MTSS or to go along with MTSS um, as more <coughs> of the whole child. So really um, seeing how we can mesh it into the social emotional and um, the ELA and the math, but really making it data based. So, um, we're, we're working towards in that direction as a school and um, I think it's you know we're gonna see if we can go look at some other schools that maybe have a different model for a um, data team format and we'll see what we can kind of take from there and see what we can make our own thank you 
And just um, also on that leadership question that you asked, um, we are also in the process of talking about our leadership team makeup currently um, due to MTSS data that we got from um, some of the um, assessments that have been done throughout our school walkthroughs. Um, we are looking to add a paraprofessional onto our leadership team, and we're also looking to add a parent onto our leadership team. So Excellent. those are That's part of our idea. next steps as, as a school. Yeah. Well, I initially was going to ask that same question about how people are chosen, and your clarification that they volunteer, it makes us even stronger that people really want to be in this role. And one of my questions is how do they find the time? I'm so impressed so often by how our teachers go above and beyond. Um, you mentioned, I can't even tell you how many categories, but between grant writing and student being leadership of student council, being leadership of um, the cultural leaders, planning events, the data team meetings, everything. There's so many. Um, wonderfully connected and powerful roles that the teachers are playing on top of the classroom role that they play. And I'm just wondering how that gets juggled and. Well, for the um, leadership team, we meet before school, we meet at seven o'clock in the morning um, on meeting days. So that's one way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, I think if you, I, I think at any school in Reading, I think you'll find the same thing. The teachers are incredibly dedicated. Mm -hmm. Thank they you. find the time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming out tonight. Linda, I thought you'd like yes. To yes. <laughs> sure. Can you read the motion? There's a one there. We have a motion. We have a motion. Um, the motion is approval of Camp Bondale uh, field trip. Move to approve the annual grade field trips to Camp Bondale, Bondale and Camp Mass as outlined in the superintendent's memorandum. Is there a second? Second, second. second. Did you want to? I can, I can let Eric speak. Yeah. This is, uh, we're going to be in our third year of this trip. Right. Um, it's, it's a great experience for the, for the kids. I'll let, but I'll let Eric speak. Um, so thank you very much for allowing me a few minutes just to speak about Camp Warndale and I think in your package you'll see that over time we've continued to uh, find opportunities to expand this trip f across all of Reading. So we started with just Birch Meadow and Killam to get uh, a sense of whether this was something that would be great for all of Reading's fifth graders and last year uh, when we had all of our fifth graders in Reading attend, we had some really positive feedback. In, a, uh, in your package, you'll see we surveyed parents uh, as well as the students to get their feedback about how they felt about this trip and what the opportunity really meant for them. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the parents that were there, um, it was overwhelmingly positive for them and the feedback they got from the kids if they weren't able to attend. But when their kids came home, the kids had such positive reactions to the trip from what they learned from spending time with their friends from the overnight experience uh, from having such engagement in science and hands-on activities uh, it really set a stage for a positive successful school year for a group of fifth graders uh, we feel like this is a, a good time to start the overnight experience for fifth graders we feel the one night is an appropriate um, opportunity for them we want to make sure that all fifth graders can go so we offer financial support for any student uh, who may be having some financial difficulty uh, or families who are in need. We provide those opportunities at the school-based level. Principals are happy to support families um, who have needs, and we reach out to those families to make sure we can um, encourage all, all students to go. Uh, we have a ratio for parents. Uh, we make sure we have two parents for every 10 students um, that are in attendance. So I think that really helps at the stages in terms of oversight. And there's obviously a, a great support staff at Camp Boyndale who run all the activities and make sure that the flow of time for the students is well spent and highly engaging. So I'm uh, happy to be able to support and encourage the school committee to approve this trip. And I know the teachers and parents uh, and students are going to be eagerly looking forward to it next year. No, I can give a plug for it. I had a fifth grader go, this, I guess it was in October, maybe? Sometime? Yes, it was October, yeah. yeah. 
and he thoroughly enjoyed it yeah. and got a lot out of it. So. Yes. Quick question about the parent survey. Was that electronic and anonymous? It was electronic. It was a survey monkey, so electronic anonymous survey, yes. If I could just say, I think that's fantastic. I think sometimes as a parent, if you if you have something that you want to communicate, particularly if it's negative, you may not it's not a big deal and you don't want to cause a problem, but a survey gives you the opportunity. Also, because it's anonymous and electronic, we can take these incredibly positive results to heart. This this these results are insane. 98, 99, 100 percent. That's that's wonderful. Um, just being as a parent in the community, I really appreciate that you reached out to parents, um, and, uh, as, and even more importantly, the students. So thank you for having that kind of 360 view and getting feedback from everyone. That's that's really powerful. Thank you. Yes. Well, sorry. Um, I think that what you're doing in your school and this um, collaboration across the schools acknowledges a really important aspect of education, the culture of the schools, and that impacts the education, as you said. And I just, kudos, it's extra work, but at what amazing payback. I think it's wonderful. Um, did you have most fifth graders able to attend? Did most kids, you said some weren't able to come. Mm -hmm. Did most go? Most went at the, we had, at uh, Birch Meadow, we had three students that were not able to attend last year, and I think that was about the average. We had two or three students at each school. Wow. Um, and so we made sure we had alternative activities that aligned with the science standards for those students that were not able to attend. Great. Thank you. And did you, how did you choose the parents? Sorry. That's all right. Um, we had, we opened it up for parents, and then it's, each school is kind of, pulling names out of a hat. You keep in mind, for boys' cabins, you have to have male chaperones, and for the girls' cabin, you have to have female chaperones, so you have to make sure you, you have that balanced as well. So that's, that's the process we go through. Yes. Can I ask another? I'm just sort of, I'm tying together different aspects of what we've done this year, and one of the things that we started out this year with was the fingerprinting. Did you get any pushback about that for um, parents that wanted to go? Were they comfortable and understanding? I didn't hear I didn't hear any pushback on my end. It was um, sent out very early in the year, um, prior to we. So t the parents had plenty of notice to get the fingerprinting done. We made it very clear we have a parent night for Camp Borndale, and we let them know at the parent night if you're interested in being a chaperone, this is one of the expectations um, that's set forth um, by policy. So we asked, we made sure that the parents knew well in advance, so we didn't run into any issues. We've not had any pushback on the fingerprinting. Uh, for parent volunteers, mm -hmm. for the activities that we require it for. Right. Other than the one that came. Yeah. That back. one, yes, that one gentleman. That was <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, um, yes. So I was going to ask about the fingerprinting as well, just to see how it went. I'm glad that it's been uh, accepted. Um, so the one thing that I was looking at was, um, so what, so is, is there a physical activity there? Is there, I saw adventure, mm -hmm. so I'm is assuming an adventure education, um, so like a low rope, so just those types of activities that, is that part of it as well, is that? There's both, so adventure is a, a component of team building, so if, you know, kind of using the ropes as the example, so how to get the students maybe across the rope or how to, how to climb over wall and work as a team and collaborate um, in various activities that are kind of team building, which is what the adventure course is really all about. Uh, they build in short break times for students so they can have kind of almost like a recess time built in within their within their time that they're there. But it's really a, it's kind of a limited amount of time because there's so much learning and content that has to happen, but the kids do get a little bit of runaround time as well. Great. Great. Thank you. Ready for the vote. All those in favor? 4-0. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. So Thank you so much. Thank you for time. Why don't we uh, do reports now? Uh, Carl, how you doing, pal? <coughs> I said, hi, pal. Hello. You've been quiet over there. Thank you. Um, so the girls' hockey team beat Acton Boxborough 3 nothing to win the uh, state championship. As Mr. Scarpino pointed out to my lunch table, this is Redding's fourth state title in the last three years, which is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, spring sports are in session. Um, thankfully, the 
turf fields have been plowed, which students are very happy about, so there's more time in the field house. It's less crammed. Uh, the sef uh, sophomore semi was last Saturday. It was a fun time. Um, and the big event this week is Mr. RMHS tomorrow. Um, everyone's pretty excited for that. So I, I believe it's 7 o'clock in the auditorium. Mm. Uh, probably sold out. Actually, definitely sold out show. So it should be fun. Great. Thanks. Any other reports? Yes. I have one. Um, on March 17th, the Recreation Committee met. And I've got a couple of updates. The Saturday Night Lights program, which is um, an insanely popular football program here in the community, is partnering, is hoping to partner this summer again with pro camps. Um, last year they got Gronkowski to come out and work with the kids, and this year they're hoping to get Julian Edelman. So that will be a very cool program. They're targeting Saturday, July 18th, and I know they've already been in contact with the school department to work on fields and field house rentals and all that. So um, mark your calendars if you have football kids. Um, I think everyone on this committee is aware that there's a proposal going to special town meeting about lights for the this um, the turf um, turf two and Morton Field and the softball field out here. So um, and the little league field. In the little league field, thank you. The um, the original proposal was a, a whole package of 2.3 million. What they're doing now is proposing to split that, so spend one million dollars this year just to light everything, and then down the line. Um, do some enhancements to the physical, including a pavilion and some other things. So that will be happening at special town meeting. There are two upcoming events that are very applicable to the schools. On April 2nd at the Reading Memorial High School Performing Arts Center, Chris Heron, who is a former NBA player um, who battled successfully against substance abuse, will be presenting. It's very appropriate for middle school and high school families. Um, so that is going to be an excellent um, event April 2nd at 7 o'clock. On April 28th at Coolidge at 7.30, Bob Bigelow will be presenting. He's written a book um, and he speaks about what youth sports should really be about. And it's about team building and about building character and about being a good teammate and um, how sometimes it's the parents who can kind of get in the way of what the kids know, which is it's about having fun and learning to work as a team. So he's a really inspirational speaker. He'll be coming on April 28th. That would be really good for elementary and middle school families. And finally, hot off the presses, the recreational egg hunt will not be happening this Friday, April 3rd, because the fields are covered in snow. <laughs> so. I think that would be a great. It actually would be if you gave them like little shovels and just set them out. <laughs> yeah. Or I should put them on the turf fields. But any families with young eggs. children who are looking for that event, um, uh, in lieu of that, on Friday, April 3rd at 3 o'clock at Coolidge, they will have Dan Grady's Marvelous Marionettes, a great show and contests, and it'll still be a great time. So that is the recreation report. Great. So uh, just to add to that, I guess last night the FinCom did, or the yeah, the FinCom, FinCom. voted to approve the the light project. Article four. Yeah, and it, it also includes an upgrade to the lights at the lights Turf themselves. Two. Yep. Because of the safety with lacrosse balls and I think primarily lacrosse, but. Uh, and yes, put, they and don't also energy saver and yeah. energy yeah. saving. Yeah. If I can just ask a follow up on that, we were told that the proposed plan was ten year debt. Is that continue to be how it will be financed? Yeah. That was what okay. we heard. That's what years. town meeting's going to get. Yeah. Great. Thank uh, you. What fields specifically are they? Uh, the uh, softball, the the softball fields that the football team practices on in the fall. That field so adjacent to the old. Birch, uh, Nagination yeah, Station. Station right. And then uh, the, the, Var the Morton Field. Morton Field. Uh, the, the base Little League Field that's right out here. And there was something else. The Turf uh, 2 uh, lights. And Turf 2 is up, upgrade, yeah. And yeah, I guess that's it. And, and they're going to move the old Turf 2 lights down to, I heard last night, Dan Enzimer told me to. to Castine Field. Oh, that's right. Yes. Because that's, you know, that that could use a, I mean, that's like really dark, even with the lights on. So. Hockey, the hockey yeah, the skating, area. skating area. Did Did you have any reports, Gary? No. Yes. Yes, I have a couple. One, um, last week I went to Metco Lobby Day with our Metco director Jason Cross. And it was a very, very um, 
inspiring day with the speakers, and we got to visit with um, an aide to Representative Jones, who unfortunately is out with a broken leg and had just had surgery. But he's doing better. I just got a letter from him reinforcing his support of the program. Um, we had o an overflow crowd with Senator McGee's aide. Um, such poignant stories were told both by the um, suburban families and by the Boston families who were able to take advantage of this powerful program. Um, we corresponded and saw um, Senator Lewis and Jim Dwyer, who couldn't be there, but we've corresponded with him. Um, so it was a very powerful day, and given that some of the money has been reinstated, there's recognition of how important this program is. But the question is, can we not only just get that money back, but also can we find funding to support this important program that goes beyond that? Um, while we were there, Senator Lewis approached me and asked if maybe our school committee might be interested in having he and another senator come present at a meeting in a sort of an informal roundtable to answer questions and fill us in, answer our questions and fill us in on what's happening on the state level, um, which was great. Um, and we actually went, Jason Cross and I actually went by bus with the METCO on a METCO bus from the METCO office, which was really exciting to be a part of that energy mm -hmm. and to hear people's stories because there are multi-generational people who have been in METCO for a long time and now their kids are or their directors are. It was very powerful. An update on the Human Relations Advisory Committee. Can um, I just ask a question? Was, I'm sorry, was sure. Jason a METCO student? No. Okay. He wasn't. Because I know uh, Jacinia was, wasn't she? Jacinia. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. No, curious. it's okay. Um, the Human Relations Advisory Committee, we have our next meeting on April 2nd. Sorry, Chris Heron. Um, and Chris Heron, by the way, is awesome. I saw him a couple of years ago. Um, but the Human Relations Advisory Committee is having a, um, some visitors from the Winchester Multicultural Network. We're still looking for members if you're interested in coming. We're talking about um, the organization of our committee and um, protocols for response and any other questions. There have been questions generated by the committee, so please come. It's at 7 o'clock at the police station. Um, I also, oh, and also Winchester Multicultural Network <coughs> is having an annual training session. Find the tools, skills, and competence to address diversity and inclusion challenges in your life. And that's on April 11th from 9 to 3.30. If you're interested, please email me and I'll give you more information on that. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of others. Sure. Is that right? Quickly, um, just so at Parker was wonderful. It was... Um, an amazing set, great teamwork, um, beautiful singing and dancing, and it really, the kids just shown up there. And from around them, the adults who supported them were shining as well. So thank you to Parker Middle School. And um, on April 10th, Andrew's not here, so I thought I'd fill in. So on April 10th, an improv night is being held by PSST and the drama department. Um, and at that evening, Boston Improv, um, is coming to perform. Our, our drama director, Natalie Kuna, is actually in, on that improv team, and they will be performing also um, with Improvisaurus, the high school's improv team. They'll be there. And then I also wanted to say one last one, mm -hmm. was just I walked into the um, Performing Arts Center this week, and it was amazing because in circles around the room, students had their heads together and were working, not just rehearsing, they're actually constructing The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, which is a spring play. And so what you will, this is really a new approach. And the students had brought in bags of props and they were constructing their characters and they'll be working at adapting the script. So it promises to be a really exciting new opportunity <coughs> in the drama. In, and that's, I believe, the performance is in April. I didn't bring the date. The performance is in May. May, May sorry. May 2nd, 1st, 2nd, 3rd. I wasn't that far off. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. But stay tuned yeah, because yeah. Mrs. Engelson will be announcing that too. Um, thank you.
Great, thank you. I, I do, I have, I have one, one report. Um, I found out prior to this meeting that our single audit, which uh, Melanson and Heath is our CPA firm that does our single audit, um, we're required by law to have a single audit because our federal grant exceeds $500,000 on our IDEA, which is our, um, our largest grant that we have. Um, there were no findings and they were in the process of submitting it, so I'm very pleased to report that. So we're waiting to hear back on our end of year audit. Um, they finished the field work a couple of weeks ago, so I think they're in the they're drafting the report, and I haven't heard that there are any any findings on that. But certainly, I'll I'll let you know if there are. So, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we have busily been preparing for our annual April Professional Institute. I gave you some handouts there um, to look at. I mean, we're thrilled with the offerings that we're able to put in place for this year. We're, especially, for instance, we are partnering this year with the Safe and Supportive uh, Learning learning Environments, the Safe and Supportive Schools, um, recipients of the grants over the last few years. We're going to be hosting them this year. Um, we have a couple of great keynote speakers, I think. Um, one is one was recommended by some administrators in some other districts who have happened to see him um, at some other national conferences, Bruce Taylor, who is an arts educator and speaker. He's the author of a book called Common Sense Art Standards, How the Arts Can Thrive in an Era of Common Core, um, which is a great book. It talks about just how important the arts are to children's education, how they continue to be, even you know, more so in the, in the current era that we're in. He actually has a new book that just came out as well, Common Sense, Common Core, Finding the Common Ground of Clarity and Simplicity. He's been great. He's been sending me his ongoing analysis is it really it's fascinating how the arts type of thinking you know the sort of those higher order skills of creativity and synthesis and application apply even more so across all content areas um, as across the country we you know um, instill these new standards um, <coughs> put these new standards in place and so it's great and I think he's going to be very timely we also have award-winning author Susan Campbell Bartoletti um, who is a probably best known for her nonfiction works for young people ranging and she's got works for elementary kids middle level high school um, she's been the recipient of a Newberry honor examples um, they called themselves the KKK um, growing up in Hitler's shadow um, she's actually one of the recommended authors that in the state framework they in the appendix they always have a list of suggested or you know, possible authors and she's one of the ones um, highlighted there for, for nonfiction. Um, and again, she was recommended by some of our own staff in the district who has happened to see her at some other national events. So we're, we're looking forward to them. We think that they're gonna be very timely. Um, and we've really worked hard, or we've tried to, um, you know, have things that were very timely for all different grade levels, all different content areas. Um, in some situations, you know, I'll give you an we've even sort of written them, written a description of a, of workshops ourselves and find somebody that we think can present them. I mean, one example is the Next Generation Science Standards. We had several things in science. We, I felt like a good overview was important. Um, and we were reaching out to different districts, different people in the state. We have the STEM director for the DESE coming to give that presentation. We have several people from the state mm -hmm. actually giving some presentations as well as from other districts. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. I think it's going to be a great opportunity, not only for our staff, but for other um, professionals, uh, educators that will be coming from other districts and the opportunity to network with each other. So we're looking forward to it. Do you have a lot of people signed up yet? Or? No, I don't know the current number. In the last week, we started to get more of a rush. So yeah. I honestly don't know. It wasn't really high in the last week, but I've been getting emails every day. And so, yeah, we, I, um, we just I sent out a big email know. blast today. Uh, throughout the state, so good. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. I have a, I have a few things. Um, one is I, I just want to. Uh, um, Carl talked about the turf fields, and that was an ongoing process for a while, trying to make sure that we we found a company that a was insured, and b was not going to damage the fields. Um, and Martha put in a tremendous amount of time and effort 
to find a, a company. Actually, the person lives in Reading, right? Uh, well, they, you, their dad used to coach here or something. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and did a tremendous job on Monday morning. You saw the snow was going all over the place, and now we have three, three fields. And, it, and it's great to see the spring sports able to get outside and, and to use those fields. And, and I know that the youth sports are starting to use them as well. So, um, and now that it's lighter out at night, that's, that's even better. So I just want to thank Martha for, for her diligence on that. Um, we have had some very busy high school activities going on. Um, our winter co last weekend was a big weekend. We had our winter color guard participate here um, at the, in a Nesbitt competition. They received a silver. Uh, the robotics team was uh, competing last weekend. Um, so they have completed their two invitational tournaments. One was here in Reading. The other one uh, last weekend was in Smithfield, Rhode Island. They now have to wait till all the other teams finish this weekend to see where they rank. Uh, if they rank in the top 62, I think, um, they will move on to WPI for the state tournament. Um, it looks pretty good. It looks pretty good. I was talking, we actually met last night with the robotics um, contingent um, to talk a little bit about <laughs> how the tournament went. They wanted to pick our brains as judges. Um, and they were they were sharing with us that, um, that they feel that they're in a pretty good place right now to be able to go to state. So uh, we'll we'll know that in, after this weekend. Um, and then our science Olympiad teams. We we actually now have three science Olympiad teams. We have one at the high school. We have and one at each middle school. Um, the high school participated last weekend in the uh, the high school state science Olympiad tournament. They had several students who placed in the top 10 in events. Um, that was great. And then Parker and Coolidge uh, participated the week before. Uh, Parker did very well, and Coolidge won the tournament. So now they're going to go to the Uni University of Nebraska in mid-May. Um, and we'll be coming on April 6th with that field trip for you to, uh, to review. Um, I do want to put in a plug, and I know we're going to have a meeting uh, before this, but um, Arts Fest is April 14th and 15th, uh, which is just before this conference. Um, it's a great event. Um, I believe also the portraits are going to be displayed at the Arts yes, Fest. Yes, I did. Was, I did not. Was I not supposed to say that? No. Oh. We've got to confirm with the schools. I just need to hear back from Mr. Surratt that okay. he will absolutely get us the portraits right okay. before. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's two nights. Um, our uh, all of our students that are in uh, different performing groups will be performing, which is which is great. Um, and then we have artwork all up and down Main Street of um, uh, grades one through twelve. So um, that will that will be a great event. And then uh, very briefly, we have two searches going on, as you know, one for the high school assistant principal search. Um, those applications have now closed. Uh, we had seventy four applications for that position. Um, so it's going to be a very competitive search. Uh, and the screening committee has met uh, once. They're going to meet again soon. Um, interviews are scheduled, I believe, for um, in a, uh, a week from next, in two weeks. And then uh, Joshua Eaton, um, that application process is still going on. Those applications don't close until um, the 6th of April. Uh, the screening committee has met twice already. They have designed the questions, and those interviews will be um, in two and a half weeks. So those searches are moving along um, right on right on schedule. Did, so, did you say 74? 74 for the high school, yes, uh, AP. And how many in-house? Do we have any in-house? I, I really yeah. don't know. Talk about that. <laughs> it's confidential. It's confidential. <laughs> Hopefully this isn't coming out of left field. Uh, I got a question on the robotics. Uh, yes. I think that, you know, we've talked a little bit about, I think maybe in next, you know, when we do the budget next year, we should maybe look at looking at that as a, as a team, uh, like we fund other teams. I know that. Uh, yeah. Um, it, it may require a bigger conversation because you have other academic groups that are also teams. And okay. Well, so we may need to have, we'll, we'd have, to have a bigger conversation. For, yeah. But certainly, yes. <coughs> Um, that's that's my report. Great. 
Thank you. Uh, what are we going to do? The wall update first. We may want to do all three together so yep. you can see how they kind right, of so flow with each other. <laughs> probably start with natural gas. Then. Yeah. Why don't we, oh, why don't sure. Do Let's gas. start with natural <laughs> gas. So, um, as we discussed, or as the memo states. Um, and I think I alluded to this during the budget process that that the when you were when we were looking at some of the comparatives year over year, you could see that the natural gas line for for um, DPW was was much less than what their actual expenditure was last year. So we have corrected it in the FY16 budget, and um, and and we knew that there was a you know a potential risk this year if, if we had a bad winter, and and so far we know we've had a, a tough winter. Um, the building is is uh, the system that's in place in the building isn't on controls like so here at the high school the, uh, the high school heating system is on Johnson controls so you can schedule it to be colder at night be off on the weekends come on early before the kids arrive that sort of thing there are no controls at DPW so if the last man out at night doesn't shut the thermostat down or do anything with the thermostat um, you know it's, it's going to be heated all night long the month of February, they effectively ran a 24-7 operation because they were in there at night clearing snow from downtown. So those big bay doors were open continuously, allowing heat to escape. They don't, the doors aren't on any sort of sensor or auto to close. So that is potentially, um, when I discussed in here that, that Ms. Cologne, um, Mr. Huggins and I have been talking about different possibilities to try and curtail the heat loss, if you would. Um, that would be a huge capital project. There's about, I think Kelly estimated 10 to 12 doors, and it's probably mm. about $10,000 a door. Mm. So I don't know that we're going to recoup $100,000 worth of heat savings over a three to five year period. So I don't know that it would be a positive ROI to, to put something in place there. So um, we do know that we have savings from electricity. Um, so the overage, I think I forecasted the, the total expense for the year to come in at about 94000 or $64,000 over budget. I know that I have savings due to the budgeting um, for electricity. We had, hired, we had budgeted the electricity consumption correctly. We had factored in a higher rate than what RMLD actually um, proposed and, and Im implemented. So we have about $15,000 of savings there to help mitigate the 64, which is how we arrived at the, the $50,000 that we needed. It was voted last night um, to be included in a warrant for the special town meeting or for no, the, regular the regular town? No, the regular town meeting. It's a little confusing. The article where you, the article where you um, sh make shifts in the current fiscal year <laughs> budget. So um, FinCom did vote to recommend that article, so we'll know after the, the town meeting whether that gets approved. Um, as of right now, I'm, I'm paying the bills because we have to pay the bills. Yeah, and, and I, I recall around. from last night very little to no questions. There. I mean, I think people understand it's yeah. that this winter was an aberration. I mean, yeah. Yeah, everybody's was, heating bill is, is higher. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's it's. We thought last year was kind of the abnormal year when you look at it graphically. Last year was kind of the outlier, and this year has even exceeded last year. So, um, last year you had the cold, but you didn't have everyone on duty all weekend with right. you know yeah. plowing. Yeah. So, and it's interesting when you look at it graphically, you can see where the snowstorms are. You know, where, what months you've had snow, what months you haven't. So. Um, uh, March came in, it was over last year, but it wasn't as bad as the, the Delta on for February. And, and hopefully, you know, March and April will be, or April, May, June will be less expensive. So, Let's hope. so that was, uh, that was natural predicting gas. Predicting snow for Saturday, though. I'm sorry? They're predicting snow for Saturday. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Minus snow. Are we going to put a roof over the turf fields? <laughs> Uh, it'll no. be fine. Yeah, it'll be fine. So <laughs> weekend <laughs> storms are good for superintendents, but <laughs> yes. bad, bad for <laughs> DPW <laughs> and tax Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so can I just ask? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So this is, this is also based on the old gas contract, correct? Yes, it yeah. is. So it's still at the positive deck so, of price. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a positive. At least mm -hmm. we're not looking at it at the new deck. Right. Yeah. Um, that takes care of the gas one. Where's my next one? Where do you want to go next? Do you want to go to the retaining wall yeah, next? Yes, I think okay. so. So the retaining wall. Um, again, this one was discussed and voted on at um, FinCom last night. Um, 
they, they favorably recommended to, this one went into the debt, right? Yes, so um, I, just so you know, this article is being sponsored by the selectmen as a courtesy to the school committee. And the reason why is the warrant had to close on Tuesday night. Normally, you were going to meet, tonight's meeting was going to be <coughs> Monday night, because, but we, we thought we were going to have a bid for you tonight to vote on. Um, but that's the next thing yeah. we'll talk about. Um, so you, you would have been the original sponsor of the article, but because the warrant had to close Tuesday night, the selectmen are sponsoring the article as a courtesy. Can, can you talk about the wall? I don't think we've had a meeting. We've gotten stuff via email about what's going on, but for right. the public purpose, what's, what, what we're actually talking about, the sure. wall project, because I don't think everybody's aware, or we're aware of it. But yeah, um, sure, no, that, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, I think it was early September yes. um, when school had just started back that we were um, made aware that there was a, a potential separation of the wall or failing of the wall. and. Uh, upon you know, visually, you can see it. So it, it's very apparent that the wall has has failed at certain points along um, along the structure. It's the wall, we're talking about the wall that um, uh, hopefully I describe it well. It's the wall that's adjacent to the pack, the the performing arts center, starting at the top, coming down um, to the staircase. The 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 lower half of the wall, the much higher, steeper wall. That one is fine. That one already has been um, repaired. Um, or, or rebuilt a few years ago. It was rebuilt during the high that, school project. Yeah, that was yeah. part of the, we got paid for that. Yes, yeah. correct. Yes. So um, uh, what we did is we engaged PAR, which is a, uh, an engineering firm, to come out and, um, and, and survey to see if there was any immediate danger. Um, and as luck would have it, we had torrential rains, I think almost three or four days in a row, so they were able to look and say, okay, it didn't move at all. If it didn't move at all during that rain, it's, it's, there's no imminent danger of it collapsing, which gave us time to, to thoughtfully approach um, what we wanted to do. Um, we engaged them. Uh, we had a special, uh, the FinCom approved the funding for PAR. No, the town meeting did in town November. Meeting. November okay. town no. meeting did. Thank you for PAR to come out and do um, site surveys and give us an opinion of cost. Um, they couldn't do the site surveys because of the eight feet of snow that we received. <laughs> and so they did testing, uh, some testing, a couple of weeks ago, and that's how they arrived at their 50% opinion of cost. They have been on site this week, and they're finishing their testing the rest of the time <coughs> um, this week. And so we hope to have 100% expectation of cost uh, either by the end of next week or the, the week after. So as we communicated last night at the FinCom meeting, by town meeting, we will have a 100% expectation of cost or estimation of cost. Um, some of the questions that came up last night concerned um, the fill. Um, at this time, we don't think that there are any issues with the fill that's up there. They're, their testing so far hasn't uh, turned up any issues. Um, but I think that they wrote some language in here s suggesting that you know it's subject to the fill um, being acceptable. I think, um, I think that's it. Is I think the other the, thing the to point ahead. out is uh, I think someone asked, and we've all asked it, is there any remedy in, uh, through the project? And I think we all agree that no, there isn't. No, because uh, it's been eight years. Yeah. Uh, it's unfortunate, but it, you're right. It's been eight years. and The... Um, the, r the reason for the wide range right now is because it's only a 50% opinion of cost. So what we've been told in the report is that it, it probably will not exceed 650000 or whatever yes, that high number is. Yeah. So right now the article, that's, that's the high-end number. But it, it's, it's very likely it will be probably somewhere in between. They also yeah. haven't made a determination to what extent the wall has to be repaired. Right, so, which so is what determines the cost. The, the high end of the cost. I think the high end of the cost was if they had to replace the entire, entire length. length of the wall right. um, versus, you know, doing it in, in two to four foot increments depending upon where where it's, you know, deemed that it hasn't failed. So, Do they look at anything other than the wall? I mean, is there, I'm not saying, I'm just thinking out loud, is there any other ideas other than just rebuilding what we have? Uh, do they do any of that or? They are gonna, uh, we have engaged them to do design work, to design to rebuild a retaining wall. So it might not end up being the same design yeah. um, or, or 
or underlining or pinnings. I, th I think visually it'll probably look very similar to the other wall, but we're, n we're not at that stage it's, Yeah, yet. the anchor structures that are going to have to happen. I, the evidently, pinnings. there were not anchor structures put into this wall like there was on the other wall that was rebuilt. And that's what's causing some of the shifting. So with, with a wall, and then maybe I, we can ask when we get to that point, but with, with the fact that there's a parking lot up there, we couldn't just have like a rolling, you know how we have up, I'm always pointing up, <laughs> up by Oakland Road. We have that grassy hill yes. there. There couldn't be something like that? Well, not without taking parking away. Okay. Any other questions? No. No. Okay. And the and modulars. And then once, um, once Martha's done explaining the modules, then we can talk about how this all kind of intertwines together so that, because I think it was a little confusing last night <laughs> when I was explaining. Um, so for the modulars, um, uh, I, I, first I want to thank the, the evaluation committee, which was comprised of Mr. Robinson, um, Ms. Cologne, Mr. Huggins, and um, Mr. Bowen, and who's uh, the district licensed electrician. Um, it was a good group. Um, we, we had four people uh, request the bid. Um, one person, uh, one group did not, ch it chose not to bid, and then uh, three people came out for the site visit. And after the site visit, another person, another vendor chose not to <coughs> submit a bid. So we, we ended up with two bids. Um, we did the non-proposal, the non-price proposal evaluation. Um, that was a very good process. Um, and then we went to review the price proposals. And the price proposal um, exceeded um, the value of the project. And it also um, pointed out to us that the price proposal was uh, not, not well. It was, it was kind of amb ambiguous. Um, it didn't specify costs, whether it was new, whether it was uh, refurbished or like new. Um, and, and so it, it, the bids were rejected based on that. <coughs> so that allowed us to go back and say, well, let's talk to the vendors and, and see what we can glean to help refurbish the bid, to put the bid out again. And so subsequently we learned, you know, one vendor, the vendor that didn't bid was because of the, um, the liquidated damages clause. Their corporation won't accept liquidated damages. So that precluded someone from bidding. Talking to the uh, chief procurement officer in Barnstable about their experiences, they've, had cl um, they've included the liquidated damages and they've done it without the liquidated damages. And, and some of the feedback that they gave to us, and I know Mr. Robinson concurred and the, the group concurred, they're going to increase their contingency if you have liquidated damages and their insurance costs are increased if there are liquidated damages because their insurance company is concerned that they might be on the hook for something as well. So um, we have made some changes to the RFP. It is currently with uh, with town council for them to vet and just make sure that, that you know nothing structurally has changed in the, the bid. And it will be live on the central register on Wednesday. Um, so we submitted on Tuesday. There's a week lag before. So you submit on Tuesday, and then it appears live the following week on the Central Register. And um, we expect to have a site visit on the 8th. We're not going to require it. It's highly recommended. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we'll have some um, bids again on the 16th to review. And uh, I think we're recommending or requesting a, a, a school committee meeting on the morning of the 17th. Prior early, to, yeah. early Friday morning on the 17th um, so that the bid can be approved if assuming we have a, a bid um, so that that leads to the town meeting piece but I, I guess maybe we should stop there to see if you have any questions about yeah that. I'll just add a comment I mean there was well, I guess this was last Friday we met yeah mm -hmm. there was a lot of angst I think with the committee to you know do this as opposed to you know not doing it and I, it's the right thing to do uh we'll we'll still we'll still be in school in september so i think it's the good decision i agree it was a unanimous decision by the committee there we, we, it, it was a lot of discussion <coughs> um, back and forth on the pros and cons and what our options were um and um and i think the i think we came to the right conclusion is we want to bid it again so the the purpose of having of the Friday morning meeting to approve a, a bid is so that um, we can actually give then guidance for town meeting, which at the special town meeting. 
So there's going to be a special town meeting within the town meeting on the Monday, is it the 26th, 27th? 27th. Um, and the special town meeting has an article for the lights for the recreation. It has an article for the modular classrooms. It has an article for the retaining wall. Um, the article for the modular classrooms is there for a couple of reasons. One, it's, it's a placeholder in case, and, and we don't, we, we think this is a remote possibility, but in case the bid is, um, goes higher than the 1.2 that has been um, appropriated. Um, but we're gonna do everything that we can, and I know that, that Chuck said that last night as well, um, to make sure that you know, we keep the cost at, at the 1.2, that we'll have to figure out other ways. Um, the town manager has expressed an interest of converting the 1.2, which is currently free cash, to debt um, along with the lights um, so that the, free, the amount of free cash that is used is, is reduced because of the excessive snow and ice overage of this winter. Um, if, if we're able to, to, if the bids come in lower um, than the amount, and town meeting, the article is to convert it to debt, the 1.2 to debt. The one caveat is that we would not be able to make a payment to the bid winner until after town meeting is over. So if the contractor does not um, agree to that, then it stays as free cash and the motion is tabled. Um, so there's, there's a lot of moving parts here. And so what will happen is the reason why the school committee should vote on the 17th is so that conversations can happen with the contractor mm -hmm. um, to see if they're willing to, to go the route of, of withholding payment for a few weeks uh, after, after the contract is signed. Um, if they are not, then we will, we will start work and it'll be out of free cash. Um, does, that, does that piece make sense? Now, if, if the uh, article does get converted to debt, the next article um, is probably going to be recommended by the Finance Committee that that gets paid for out of free cash because it's, uh, it, it would be a reasonable amount of, of a project to be funded out of free cash. The, the wall. Retaining the wall. wall. The yeah. retaining wall. <laughs> so it's, there's a lot of moving parts to this, um, which, you know, I think people were confused a little bit last night, and finally I think it made sense to everyone. I mean, I think with our cost of capital being so low uh, that, you know, we're better off spending that and keeping some of the money in, as, as Bob said, for snow and ice and other things. Yes? I have to ask a really um, ignorant question, but I figured it probably I isn't. <laughs> So when you're talking about taking it out of debt, you are not talking about going to the voters to approve another debt. It's already, it'll be embedded within debt we already have that will be paid off over time. Yes. I'm just checking my understanding. Yes, no, it will not go to the voters. Um, a town meeting would need to approve it. It would need to be a two-thirds majority to approve the article. Um, so the money would be borrowed through, a you know, over over I think it's gonna be a ten, ten year, year ten year loan. So the the debt portion of the operating budget, so the amount that's paid out to debt each year, that number will will go up if town meeting approves the lights in the modulars through debt. Be like it'd be like instead of going to your uh, bank account to take money out to buy a car using a credit card and paying the interest right. on it. Interest is really and our interest is so low because of the yeah. AAA yeah. bond rating. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Is it so okay. that I think that's all three of the moving parts. Um, so the school committee tonight would need to vote um, to support articles five and six, and also to support the uh, addition to the natural gas line item in the town facilities budget. So uh, RMHS retaining wall and modular classroom move to support 
Article 5 and Article 6 on the Special Town Meeting Warrant dated April 27th, 2015. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? Yes. Just a clarifying, it's a procedural <coughs> question. Um, in the event that this moves forward and town meeting, for whatever reason, does not want to go with the debt, the previous vote for free cash stands. It stays. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not in danger of losing the 1.2. Thank you. That was it. Good question. <laughs> Those in favor? 4 0. Natural gas. Move to request uh, $49,616 to be added to the natural gas line from the town's FY15 budget to compensate for unanticipated usage overage at the DPW garage. Is there a second? second. So that's. Uh, I was going to. I was going to correct that. I, I, that was the number in the memo. The amount that um, that Mr. Lelisher used last night was fifty thousand. Right. So. And that's uh, coming out of free cash, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. I do believe so. Any other question? All those in favor? Four zero. <laughs> Thank you. Brent, oh, no. That's why Chris isn't here, because we got to talk about friends and family day. <laughs> <laughs> he won't be on the committee anymore. <laughs> So this is about the time that um, we have the discussion on whether or not the school committee would like to participate in Friends and Family Day because we have to fill out the application and request a booth. We don't have to decide tonight if what the topic will be, but we just need guidance if we're going to do it. I, I think we should. But I agree. Yeah. I also think we should, even if it's just to be accessible to chat with people who have questions or... I mean, maybe we can do something a little more, have a snack, or I don't know what the rules are about that, but. I've seen other places with snacks, so I think you should, yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of big watermelons or but something, and something for kids to do while their parents ask questions. What's the date on that one? June 13th. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's usually the second. Saturday. June 13th, Second, third. Second, third. Right. I predict there will be no snow on the ground by then. Yeah. I hope not. <laughs> be where? Maybe muddy. I was going to say, <laughs> and, but you'd be like walking the sponge. Good. And we have uh, minutes. All right. I we think there's some contracts. You have some award. contracts to <laughs> approve. That? Yeah, and then I think there's a couple of donations as well, right? All right. Repair and replacement. Yes. Um, move to authorize the superintendent to enter into contract with Glass and Mira to provide glass repair and replacement services. Second. Is there any? This is the, the current vendor, and there was only one bidder, um, and we've had very um, favorable experiences with them, positive experience with them. So we're very happy to um, to enter into a new contract with them. What would what type of work would he be doing? Um, this is glass, but. Broken windows. Broken windows, yeah. Um, I think it's every year we replace the yeah. window in the superintendent's office. So yeah, the kids hit with a... Because <laughs> the kids hit with an errant rock oh, from... Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so. Home run, actually. Oh, yeah. From Since I've been here, I think we've played... I've been here three years. We've replaced it twice so far. Yeah, really? From rocks from people throwing? Uh, I know... No, the, uh, from the lawnmowers. Oh, yeah, the lawnmowers. DPW. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I, didn't I didn't want to no, say people DPW. people aren't throwing rocks at me. I'm really sorry. Yeah. <laughs> they, do, I, they do a wonderful job, but, you know, every once in a while there's a rock that gets kicked up, and um, and, and so it's, it's things like that. So replacement, things like that. I just have a quick question. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about why one bid or... Is that a concern? Um, it's not. A, it, I, I believe they were the only bidder last time as well. Um, it's posted. It's it's the same process for for all of the bids that we put out. It, it, it's advertised in the newspaper. It's advertised at town hall. It goes in the central register. And um, you know, we we actually Kelly and I had thought about that too. We wondered why there was only one one bidder. But you really don't know who's gonna bid, and and they've been a good vendor. So fair enough. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All those in favor of the motion? 
four zero. <laughs> the um, carpentry. Yeah. Move to authorize the superintendent to enter into contract with Merino Construction to provide general carpentry and construction services. Is there a second? A second. Are they the incumbent? Um, no, they're not. I, I, you know, I, I, I thought this question would come. I believe Bob Snow was the incumbent, wasn't it? And I don't think he bid again. Um, uh, this is a company that's out of Chelmsford. Um, the references were very, very favorable. Um, they've actually reached out to me twice to find out how, how the process was coming along. So they're anxious to to have the the work, and um, you know we uh, they were the low bidder, and and they are responsive and responsible. So. Again, I'll ask, um, what kind of work will they be doing? Uh, I mean, specifically, what type of work? This is um, sometimes we, um, you know, for example, they, they, we built out an office here. We changed a file room into an office. So some of the, the um, drywalling, things like that. So general stuff that, that we wouldn't have our, mace, our maintenance department do that we would outsource. Mm -hmm. So but that, small but projects we, like but that. Yeah, but maintenance has done work like that in the past not that extensive but yes I it's for ex yes. yeah it's extensive it's carpentry it's, right. yeah. <clears throat> it's not minor yeah so they develop their pricing based on a like a potential work in prog progress exactly. we give them exactly so we give them um, pricing sheets of estimated number of hours over you know year one year two year three and they put in their um, their you know their labor cost per hour their percentage markup on any materials and things like that. And so everyone does the same calculation, and that's how you arrive at um, the total projected costs. <coughs> so do they have to go on prevailing wage? Is that something that? Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. OK. Any other questions? All those in favor of the motion? 4-0. And we have uh, donations. A donation from the band parents organization. Move to accept the donation from the RMH, you know, RMH, RMHS band parent organization in the amount of ten thousand five hundred eleven and twelve cents to be used to support coaching assistant positions. Is there a second? second. So the the very specific dollar amount is that um, uh, like like all of our good partners, they um, and parent and and booster organizations, they gross up the amount so that the total amount being paid to the in this case the coaches will be the one thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars whatever the agreed amount amount was, and so they cover the cost of taxes for not only um, the the person the recipient but also um, the town side. So, how many positions is that? Um, in this case, it was ten. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Kudos to the band parent organization yeah. because that takes a lot of work to raise that kind of money mm -hmm. and that kind of dedication to what they do, and our kids all benefit from it. So, yeah, do. Patty is the new treasurer, and she was a um, a budget parent budget earlier parent. this yep. year, and she has been to a number of school committee meetings. She's a, a wonderful partner, um, and very. Uh, very responsive. All those in favor of the motion? 4 0. And girls soccer. Move to accept the donation from um, RMHS Girls Soccer Parent Association in the amount of $1,500 to be used to support a coaching assistant position <coughs> for the 2015 fall season. Is there a second? second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of the motion? 4 0. And we have, now we're at minutes. Sure. Move to uh, approve the open session minutes dated March 9th, 2015. Second. Any discussion on the minutes? I just yes. wanted to say it was great rereading because it just brought the whole meeting back again. So kudos again to Linda for capturing it. Mrs. Engelson, sorry, for capturing it. I like that review. <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor? 4 0. That's it. Does anybody have anything else they wanted to 
mention tonight. Is a motion, to, motion to adjourn. Second. 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 All those in favor? Four zero for adjourn. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. We hope Mrs. Webfield. Thanks. We get them before the hockey um. dinner. <laughs>